Uh, this morning, instead of the sorrow and dismay of what must have seemed like a plan gone wrong in Jesus' death on Friday, today we join the disciples are receiving good news of the resurrection. It's an unsurpassed moment in history, and it's an event that should shape our lives as we seek to live for Jesus each and every day. Now turn with me to John chapter 20. Uh, We're going to read from verses 1 to 23, and you'll find that on page 963 in your pew Bibles. John 20, page 963. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrappings that had been on his head were not lying with the linen cloths, but were folded in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then also went in saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them, and I don't know where they've put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary... Turning around, she said, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabini, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. When it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together in the doors with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before I um, unpack this, let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, Resurrection Sunday. I thank you that Christ did not stay dead, but you raised him in power. I thank you for the peace that that brings us. I thank you that we can uh, see this account, uh, read through it, uh, and know for sure that Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing in him we may have life in his name. Amen. Uh, This week... Oh, sorry... um, you won't have a outline in your book, but there's one up on the screen for you. Uh, hopefully you can follow along. Uh, this week I was chatting to a friend. I was asking her plans uh, for Easter and just generally how things were going. 
And she described how Easter really isn't much of a thing where she is. Uh, she also explained the feelings of her community at the moment. And she asked for prayer in connecting with her 99% uh, Muslim majority neighbours. She explained how her community and many other communities in her country were exhausted after experiencing the tremendous impact of war. Thousands of refugees and internally displaced peoples struggling merely to survive. There is a lack of basic resources, a lack of aid, growing resentment of host communities. Essentially, there's a lack of peace. It got me thinking this week that uh, on one level, uh, things are incomprehensibly different to where she is, to where we sit comfortably here in Narrabri. Food security isn't really high on our priority list, as long as we can get the best eggs. Uh, We don't worry about whether or not uh, border conflicts will creep into our communities. Uh, That's not our concern. We aren't watching the news each night, uh, waiting to hear if war is coming to our doorstep. When we look around, things here are pretty good, aren't they? In our communities, in our state, in our nation, we don't have strife and we don't have conflict or war. We have peace. Now, on one level, our situation is chalk and cheese compared uh, to my friend overseas, Now, she is in a war-torn country, desperately longing for peace. And we have peace like few others. And yet, are we really that different? Her community uh, is in desperate need of knowing that true peace doesn't come from a military ceasefire or UN intervention and further aid. And our communities are in desperate need to know that true peace isn't merely the absence of war, but something far more significant. The peace that Jesus speaks of goes beyond the absence of physical conflict uh, to a deeper spiritual peace that all of us need, a peace between God and humans. This peace that Jesus offers leads to our purpose, and he provides the power to, p- to fulfill that purpose. On Good Friday, Bernard spoke from John 19, uh, showing how Jesus, having completed and perfected the work of God uh, that he had set before him, declared, it is finished. His last words before giving up his spirit and dying on the cross. And so it's only fitting that Jesus' first words to his frightened disciples are... Peace be with you. Now, this isn't just a common platitude or greeting, but rather deeply personal and theologically rich. Is Jesus pronouncing no more strife or conflict for his followers? Will all fighting end and will they be able to live in peace happily ever after? Because that's what we normally think, isn't it? When we think about peace and when we talk about having peace? No, it can't mean that because Jesus has already said to his disciples in John 16 that to be one of his followers, they will experience suffering. But he says to take courage because he has overcome the world. And he says that I'm telling you this in advance so that when it happens in my name, in Jesus, they would have peace. So if it's not an absence of strife or conflict, what is it? And what does this peace mean as we live as followers of Jesus? We'll see that when we look at John 20, uh, specifically 19 to 22. But before we have a closer look at the peace Jesus offers, I want to recap what's come before, why Jesus declares his work finished. Because without understanding that, the peace Jesus proclaims may be misunderstood. For three years now, Jesus has been traveling the Judean and Samarian countryside with a small band of misfits. Now, these are fishermen, tax collectors, religious zealots, and revolutionaries. In short, they're a bunch of sinners who in any other context would never associate together. 
I don't know, it kind of sounds like our mob here. Jesus has been teaching and preaching, performing miracles and signs. And John, the writer of this account of Jesus' life, wants you to know that these signs all point to one thing, showing that Jesus is the Son of God, sent from God the Father to show us, to reveal to us the Father. Jesus knows that by by believing in him and by knowing the Father, we may have life. John says that that's why he's written his account in John chapter 20, verse 31. Jesus has come to do the work of the Father, to complete and perfect the work God has set before him. Uh, So what was that work? Uh, Bernard mentioned a few things, but I'll hopefully get it into three points. Uh, It was to reveal God so that we can know God and have life. It was to remove the obstacles of sin and death that stopped people knowing God. And this was done by Jesus being our substitute, taking the judgment on the cross reserved for us. Jesus' words, it is finished, are pretty loaded words, aren't they? Uh, They aren't the last words of an exhausted man just tapping out, but the words of the God-man in complete control at the end of the greatest rescue plan in history. Our sin and rebellion against God has been dealt with. Our broken relationship with the one who made us could now be restored. Uh, As one Aussie theologian said, if the cross is the gourmet cake, then the resurrection is the icing on the top. Uh, It's no surprise then that Jesus' words are paired with his first words. It's finished. Peace be with you. The events are connected and Jesus' words are connected. At the start of John 20, we find ourselves on the first day of the week. There is a newness about what is about to happen or what has happened. Friday was the completion. Saturday was rest. Sunday is new. The disciples discover that the tomb is empty and in dismay return to where they're staying. Mary, however, stays and encounters the risen Lord Jesus and returns the good news to the disciples. The day passes, and it is now that Jesus reveals himself. As we read this section, uh, listen out for Jesus proclaiming peace, proclaiming the disciples' purpose and the power that he will give. The disciples were gathered together with the door locked, because they were in fear of the Jews. Uh, 19. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus proclaims peace. The war is over. Victory has been achieved. The great enemy of God's people has been disarmed. Sin has been crushed and death has been put to death. Jesus' resurrection is the confirmation of the Father's approval. Jesus' declaration of peace is immediately followed by the proof of how this peace has been achieved. Jesus shows them the evidence of his power over sin and death. He has not been raised spiritually in some disembodied form. No, he has been raised with a physical body, still bearing the scars that won the victory. Jesus shows his disciples his hands and his side. Uh, Later on, uh, in verse 24 to 29, he will do the same thing for Thomas. And his response is by acknowledging Jesus as my Lord and my God. Jesus is not saying that, or Jesus is not saying that he has just made peace generally, but specifically between God and man. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the grounds by which our sin 
our defiance and our rebellion against God is addressed and God's just wrath is absorbed by Jesus. By nature, we are deserving of death and judgment. Without the death and resurrection of Jesus, there can be no peace between God and humans. And so the response of the disciples is only fitting. I wonder if you picked it up. Firstly, they rejoice. They receive this proclamation of peace and they rejoice. They take great joy in the fact that they can now have peace with God through Jesus. Now, secondly, Thomas's right attitude. Now, seeing the risen Lord Jesus, he gives up his pride and humbly submits to Jesus as my Lord and my God. I wonder if that's your response today. Did you wake up and rejoice, praising God that you have peace with him because Jesus died and was raised to life? Because Jesus died, was buried, rose to life for our sins according to the scriptures. Is your response to fall before Jesus every day and say, My Lord and my God, use me how you will for your glory. Give me opportunities to tell others about how amazing you are. I wonder if maybe we've lost a bit of the sheer impact of Jesus' resurrection and what it brings. At one time, we were alienated from God, his enemies destined for destruction. But by his grace, Jesus has made peace through his death and resurrection. Is it something that only comes to mind once a year on Easter Sunday? Or is it something that comes to mind every single day when you wake up? Now, the peace that Jesus achieves for us has a number of implications. Now, the peace, uh, the implications being uh, this peace between God and man God gives us a purpose and he gives us the power to fulfill that. Now, firstly, peace for our relationships. Now, the first and most important is that we now have peace with God. Now, Paul, uh, a follower of Jesus, writes uh, sometime after that, therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is now there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Uh, he wrote those words in Romans 5 and Romans 8. Uh, we have comfort and assurance that because of Jesus' death, we are forgiven. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Uh, the, the curse of sin that has plagued humans ever since the Garden of Eden has been destroyed. Because of Jesus, we can know God and we can have life in abundance. Now, secondly, we now have peace with one another. Uh, Paul, again, when he's writing to both Jews and non-Jews, to Gentiles, uh, says that both groups have been brought near by Jesus' blood. That Jesus is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the wall of hostility from Ephesians 2. Now, this peace that Jesus brings uh, brings together a ragtag bunch of disciples whose only commonality is that their sins were just paid for by their leader, Jesus, and that they are in a right standing before God. That's much the same for God's mob here, isn't it? We are old and young, Blue collar, white collar, country born and bred, city imports, Anglican, Prezi, Baptist, ethnically diverse, financially diverse. But as we've already done, we've all professed faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. What else could bring us together but the peace that Jesus won on the cross? Jesus forms new communities centered around himself. Now, Jesus proclaims peace to his fearful disciples because of what 
he has achieved on the cross and by rising to life. But Jesus doesn't offer peace and leave it at that. With our relationships restored, Jesus gives his followers a purpose. Uh, Verse 21 of John 20. Jesus says to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So we have peace with God, and because of that peace, we now have a purpose. Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now, this is our highest joy in our central purpose for existence. Jesus came to reveal God the Father, and now that peace has been achieved, we are given the task of sharing Jesus with others. We have the joy and responsibility of being Christ's ambassadors to our friends and neighbours, to our town, to every corner of the globe. Jesus sends out his followers in the peace of God by the power of God to do the will of God for the glory of God and for the good of others. As Jesus sends out his followers to share the good news that peace has been achieved between God and man, he does so by giving them power. Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, It's a foretaste of what's to come and what's to happen at Pentecost when God poured out his spirit to enable his people to love and serve him and to share with boldness the good news of Jesus. It's the same spirit alive in us today. We cannot accomplish the purpose that God's given us without the power that God's given us and that is at work in in us. The resurrection changes everything for those who trust in Jesus. And so it's important to recognize who Jesus is talking to. In these words from John 20, Jesus is talking with his followers, those who acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and my God. God's peace is available to all because of Jesus. But there cannot be peace between God and the one who rejects Jesus. John writes his account of Jesus' life so that people will believe that Jesus truly is the Son of God and in his name have life. To reject Jesus is to reject the offer of forgiveness and so remain under the judgment of God. Now, if you do not yet know Jesus as Lord and God, Come to him today, receive the peace that he offers and enjoy life in abundance as he promises. Jesus has won peace for us so we now no longer live in opposition and rebellion to God. We now no longer live under condemnation. Yes, there will be hardships and strife and even persecution in this life. Jesus is very clear about that. But we can follow Jesus knowing that he has overcome the world and our greatest need has been met. That there is peace between God and those who follow Jesus. This morning we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The tomb is empty, the power of sin and death has been defeated. It's only fitting that if Jesus' last words were, It is finished. Then his first words to his followers are, peace be with you. It's only fitting that their response is to rejoice and to fall before him and say, my Lord and my God. Jesus Jesus doesn't give peace as the world does, nor does he promise a life free of trouble. But he does promise a life to the full. God promises peace, complete wholeness in relationship with himself, through Jesus, and that is something to celebrate. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you 
uh, for sending Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not, uh, to die the death that we deserved, and to rise to life so that we can be friends with you. I thank you for the peace that Jesus offers. I thank you that you have promised uh, in Jesus life in abundance. I thank you that we have a sure uh, and certain hope uh, of the peace that you offer because Jesus has risen. Thank you that uh, we can have this account from John uh, to know for certain uh, these truths. Amen.